Our subject tonight is one that we do occasionally deal with from our platforms. I know it's part of our series. As we, as we try to extend our understanding around the changes that we hope to see in the world when Jesus comes back to establish God's kingdom on earth. And because the environment and what we eat is so important to us, it's no surprise that we find them mentioned in the pages of God's word in relation to the new order of things that he will bring to pass. Before we get to that, we need to paint a picture of our world today so that we can see why our current position isn't sustainable. And once we've done that, um, then we can help or we can use the Bible to help us glimpse at what those changes might look like. Now, I think most of you know that I work for a company that has quite a lot of interest in agriculture and the wider environment. They have something like a 75% share of the insurance market for all things countryside in the UK. For over 100 years, it's been very interested in what's being grown, how that's being done, and they're particularly interested from a claims perspective about well, what havoc environmental issues such as floods and winds and droughts, etc., can have on the work carried out by the thousands of farmers that they insure. In this country, farming uses just 1.5% of our workforce. It's about 450,000 people. But it uses 69% of our land area. It's very heavily concentrated in East Anglia, where there's lots of crops. Um, in the southwest, we've got far more dairy farms. That's not to say there aren't other places in the country where things are grown and we find farms, but, but mainly it's the southwest and the east. We know it's not an easy job. It doesn't attract a lot of young people. The hours are very long. The weather isn't the best. And it's dangerous and it's lonely work. And it doesn't pay particularly well. And because of that, the average age of a farmer in this country today is 59. In the UK, we produce about 60% of the food that we eat. So we do rely very heavily on other countries, especially Europe, to keep our supermarkets looking like they do. Now that's the UK. What's happening worldwide? Because that's really where we should be looking, given that we know and believe that God's kingdom will stretch from shore to shore right across the globe. Well, worldwide, it's quite an interesting picture. And let me talk you through what's happening. Some of this you will absolutely know, um, some of it Sadly, you might not. None of it will surprise you, though. And it's a paradox. There's nothing that we as humans do which is bigger or more harmful for our planet than agriculture, but there is nothing that's more critical for our daily survival. So the challenge that we face as human beings, if we don't believe in God and in the Bible, is that we have to work out very quickly how to keep feeding ourselves without killing the planet at the rate that we are. And let's just think about and look at why that statement is true. Here's a map of the world. And when we think about land and we think about water and we think about the resources that we have in terms of agriculture, here's what we know. 40% of all the land in the world is available for agricultural use. All of that 40% is being used. To give you an idea of the scale of that, what we know is that the area of land that we devote to growing crops in the world is the size of South, Afri uh, South America. The size of the land that we give over to livestock or pasture is the size of Africa. So in terms of the, the footprint that agriculture has, there's nothing bigger, and I'm sure we can see it can't really get any bigger because the planet's also shared with 8 billion people. Now, to illustrate the impact of agriculture, let's just think about water for a moment. On the screen, you can see a picture of the Aral Sea in, in Eastern Europe, and you can see over the last 20 years how that's got smaller and smaller and smaller. In the first picture you can see there in the top left, the length of that sea is 260 miles. Now that's shrunk to next to nothing over a couple of decades because that water's been taken for agricultural use. Another example is this, the Colorado River in America, one of the longest rivers in the world, but it no longer flows to the sea. It's agriculture and climate change that are being blamed for that river running dry before it ever reaches the Pacific Ocean. But those are just two examples. 
If we think about climate change and agriculture, then what we know is that 10 to 15% of all greenhouse gases come directly from agriculture. Another 10 to 15% from deforestation, 80% of which is caused by agriculture. And that's almost as much as the energy companies themselves produce in greenhouse gases. And linked to that is a, is a, is a, is a, a key economic point. Every pound that you invest in wind or solar energy, you get less than a pound back. Because they're less efficient than fossil fuels are. However, currently, for every pound that you invest in agriculture, you get £1.43 back. Positive rates of return. It's your, it's your quickest way to a profit, humanly speaking. And that poses a question, doesn't it? And the question is, does mankind want to pay less for their energy and more for their food to get a cleaner environment? And the answer is, what we're seeing is that actually people would rather eat their way to a cleaner environment. And that's important to think about, isn't it? Because we know that the world population by 2050 is going to reach 9.8 billion people. But we also know that 800 million will go to bed tonight hungry. Because despite there being enough food in the world to feed everyone, 9 million people die every year of hunger. 25,000 every day, 1,000 during the course of our meeting tonight, one every four seconds. Most of them are children. They are statistics, but they're also human lives, and this is mankind's problem. Now, they are huge numbers of people that we're talking about who are still in hunger. It's something like 12% of the world population. But if you went back just 30 years, you would find that 25% of the world was hungry. If you went back 50 years, you'd find that something like 36% of the world was hungry. So agriculture and the distribution of food and medicine has improved massively over the years. But can mankind ever catch up? And will that 800 million ever go any, down any further? Well, that's the challenge, isn't it? Food seems to be everywhere in this country but it's not the same all over the world. And what's been calculated by scientists is that we need to produce as much food in the next 30 years as we have ever produced. Scientists say we need as much food in the next three decades as man has produced in the last 10,000 years. And given that, as Christadelphians, we don't believe that the world is that old, you can see the size of the challenge that faces us. And we have to do it with less land, with less water, with fewer resources, because we've used them up um, you know, already. Humankind has to do something very differently, much better, more efficiently. But our rivers and lakes are running dry, and our oil is being burned, and the finite resources of the planet are dwindling. And the world faces choices, and it faces consequences. The estimates are that in the next few years, Europe will grow its agricultural production by about 4%. By comparison, Brazil is increasing its production by 40%, driven by its main export market, Europe. So can you see what's happened? Europe has taken a low productivity, low intensity approach to agriculture, and as a result, it can't feed itself. Mainland Europe imports 70% of its animal feed. So what our continent has actually done is to export its agricultural footprint to one of the most biodiverse countries on earth, Brazil. And remember what we said, 80% of the deforestation in that country is for agriculture. So what that means right now is that Europe is the largest driver, the largest reason for global deforestation after China. So we have to understand that just because locally we might be more aware and we're getting better at looking after our environment, it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for the world elsewhere. There are. And it's a paradox really, isn't it? Because what we're seeing is that people have never cared more but known less about where their food has come from. And that in part has led to some of the things happening that we've just been talking about. Now, if we were to go back to the late 60s, of just 50 years ago, what we saw were books like this one. The talk of the town was fueled um, by a belief that a decade from 1969, a billion people were going to die from hunger. Now, of course, that billion people didn't die. There were already advancements afoot to prevent that from happening. 
Just a year later, just a year after this book, in 1970, this man, Norman Borlaug, came along and he won the Nobel Prize because of his work on crop production. He was an agricultural scientist and he's credited with saving hundreds of millions of lives in Pakistan and India and other developing countries through pioneering disease-resistant high-yield wheat. He's been labelled as the father of the Green Revolution. And it was agriculture and it was better health and nutrition and medical advances that kept those people alive. But that didn't stop people worrying about population growth. However, when you look back at 1950, what you see is that the average woman was having five children. Today we're at 2.5, and in a few years' time, the projection is that we'll just be at replacement rate only. So the challenge for us in the future is not that the population is growing and growing. It isn't, in that sense. The population growth rate actually peaked in 1966. It's been in decline since then. So if population growth is decreasing, how do we go from 7.8 to 9.8 billion in the next 30 years? Well, that's entirely because people are living longer. Which, in a way, is good. It's great news if you're a human being. But it's bad for our planet. Because we have to get there without cutting down all our forests without draining all our lakes and rivers, without burning all our fossil fuels, without pouring our plastics and other waste into the sea, whilst all the time the world heats up, the weather gets more extreme, and we have an urgent need to produce more food than we ever have in the past. Which means that the next 30 years are the most important years in the history of agriculture and the environment of this planet. So can mankind do it? Can all of the amazing advancements and the technology and the science and the understanding be used to feed us all? Or is a tipping point coming when actually the world will literally be starving and broken because it cannot sustain its population in the way it has been and it cannot recover from the damage that it's caused to the planet? Well, that leads us to the second part of our talk now as we open our Bibles and our minds to a beautiful alternative. Because we believe, don't we, that the answer to the world's problems, as we've seen them so far this evening, is found in these pages. Let's begin with a very simple concept around who owns the earth. Because people outside of this hall would say, well, it belongs to mankind, it's our planet, no one else's. Well, the Bible's very clear that's not the case, isn't it? Just come right to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, because it's very clear who did what, isn't it? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 we all know these words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's what happened. There was an intervention. God looked, and he took something that was without form and void, something that was as empty as the other planets in the solar system, and he did something with it. And he didn't just create a beautiful-looking planet with a garden on it. He went further. You can see on the screen a quotation from Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. So it was a world deliberately created to be filled with living things. God designed and then brought into being a planet that could be inhabited. But he did it with balance. Plant and animal life all perfectly blended with their environment. It was not then what it is today. And you can see that just by coming over a page of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And we all understand what that's saying. Here is brought into existence via God's power... The race of beings whom he intended would inhabit the earth as Isaiah promised. That was the first thing he, he did. But, but what did he do with man, verse 8? And he planted a garden east of Eden, and there he put the man whom he'd formed. And why did he do that? Well, look at verse 15. He put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So right from the beginning of creation, the Bible is clear that, that man and woman are intrinsically linked to working with the earth. Adam was put in that garden to work with it and look after it. He was part of that creation, and God required that he interact with that creation, and in so doing, the creation would feed him. 
And all was good to begin with. Adam is joined by Eve and together, you know, they lived in that garden. We don't know how long for, but they lived in Eden in the specialness of that place. And so things might have continued had we not had Genesis chapter 3, where we know that Adam and Eve sinned in disobeying God's um, commandments. And as a result, things changed forever and we know for the worse as far as our relationship with the earth went. Just turn over a page again and look at chapter 3 and verse 17. And then to Adam, God said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. And since that day, my dear friends, man has had to work, work, and work extra hard to to feed himself from the ground on which he walks. It wasn't the same in Eden. It was all in balance. The ground and the plant life gave Adam and Eve all they needed without having to work like they did after their sin. That battle for food has been ongoing since that time. But over the centuries, what's happened is that man's ingenuity has grown but so is his ignorance. And for a long time, he's been in denial about the consequences of his greed and his pursuit of bigger and better agricultural gains and activities. And he's absolutely, absolutely unaware that there is a God who continues to sustain this planet for his own purpose. Do you know the technology is so advanced today that you you can visit farms in this country that run 24 hours a day where cows are free to wander in from the fields, you know, as they want to, to be milked. Robots detect their presence, they automatically milk them, medicate them, check them for lameness and other diseases, and via giant turntables, gently spin them round again so they can go back out to pasture. All without virtually any human interaction. The main human interaction on those farms are the trucks that go constantly taking the manure away. That's all you see. Another example is a Scottish business who are pioneering ways of growing crops indoors on huge metal trays with LED lights in a specially controlled environment. Highly intensive, very efficient, great at saving water. You can do it in any country, in any climate, with just a very small amount of space. In 40 square metres, you can grow 20 tonnes of crop in one year. That's the equivalent crop that would take you one hectare or a thousand square metres to do outside. This is man's continued search for better ways of doing things. And it's very impressive. But what it does is to convince mankind that they have all the answers. That they have all of the control. That the earth is theirs to do with as they want. That they are the masters of their own destiny. That simply isn't the case. Just come and look at a few more passages about the control that God currently has over our world and especially how it's his hand that still feeds us. Because God didn't just create, he didn't just bring into being a a planet to be left spinning for eternity while he watched on. As the creator, he doesn't just originate. He also preserves and he sustains and he protects his creation. Let's have a look at Job 34 for a moment. Job 34. I'm sure you've got these words underlined, but if you look at verse 14, it says, If God set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together. And man shall turn again into dust. And we're back in Genesis 2, aren't we? From dust we were created because of God's intervention, because God breathed life into us. The Bible paints a very clear picture that our creator crafted something carefully and thoughtfully and he brought it into existence and he keeps it a living, breathing thing. As our creator, he governs his creation. And the way the Bible is written means that it doesn't It doesn't deal with scientific explanations of the material world. It focuses far more on the relationship between God and his creation. Just come and have a look at Psalm 146. 
just a few pages on from, from where we are in Job, Psalm 146. This is what it says in verse 6. God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. And what those verses are telling us are that as much as man has a relationship with the earth and he uses it to sustain himself, all of that's only possible because of God's continued care for the earth. The creator meets the needs of his creatures. He provides food and comfort and strength for us. If you just look at the next psalm, Psalm 147, look at what it tells us here in verses 8 and 9. And think about this in terms of the context of what's important for agriculture. Psalm 147, verse 8, Who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains, he giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. The world was formed with balance. It was formed to give food to all the creatures that God created on it. And therefore, it's God who looks after it. Man's agricultural activities are continuous, but so are God's. It's just as necessary he does so now as has ever been in the past. Whether we choose to recognise it or not, one fact is true. Every single day, we experience God's action as our preserver and our governor and our provider. He's not an all-powerful but impersonal force in the universe. He's a personal God with a character of moral perfection. So what that means is that God is, is not only sustaining his creation, but he's actively guiding all things so that he will eventually be glorified. But that can only happen if there is a change. Because the world we have today is very sick. And some of the things that man has done and is, and is doing to the planet, those are things that God never intended for this world. And because God's creation has been marred by human rebellion against his will, because it contains sin and death, the activity of God is, is about restoration. His purpose through his son is that the world will be cleansed of that sin and that evil and, and that men's hearts will be won back for God. Because I think we'd all agree that right now this world is the most selfish place God has ever seen. But the mind of God is the ultimate reality that gives the universe its rational order. God also requires moral order. And he will intervene to establish it. And those changes will alter the physical properties of the planet. And it will change the environment for the better. So let's just spend a few minutes looking at what the Bible says those changes might look like. And there's, as you can imagine, lots of verses that suggest the extent to which God will alter how we see the world today. But initially, a renewed environment can only come with righteousness. People cannot hope to clean up the environmental pollution we see until they start to clean up the moral pollution. That will not happen this side of the kingdom. For the environment to begin to change, men and women must change as well. In Isaiah chapter 11, we're given a clue as to how that might be possible. You can see it on the screen in Isaiah 11 verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is clearly not how things are today, but that's where the world will have to get to. A world where a deep, reverential and appreciative understanding of God and his ways is what will govern what people do. We know that's going to happen because he's going to intervene in the most dramatic fashion possible. If you're in Isaiah, just hold a finger there, but do come over to 2 Peter chapter 3. And when you read these words, you, you get a sense of the dramaticness that's coming. Two Peter chapter three. <coughs> Verse ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That is the key environmental change we need to see first. An environment where righteousness, where right doing, as far as God is, God is concerned, is prevalent. If you're sitting in Isaiah, just come back to chapter 2 now, and it becomes even clearer what sort of mindset the human population will have in this new earth. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war. Anymore. What a picture that is of the sort of world that God intends to bring into being when his son comes back. People willingly coming to learn about him and wanting to worship him. Did you see though it's a world where weapons of war are turned into implements for agriculture. We're back in Genesis 2 again aren't we? Back to the picture of Adam being taken and placed in Eden to tend and to keep that garden. But now it's not just Eden that needs tending. It's the whole world and everyone is involved. So how will that world be different to what we see today? Well, earlier on we spoke about the challenges facing our planet, agriculturally and with the environment. Let's just spend our final couple of minutes contrasting what we saw with what's to come according to God's word. We've established that our key problems were these. We're using up our resources, especially water, at ever-increasing rates. Deforestation for agricultural use is irreversibly harming our environment. Millions are dying from hunger every year, especially children, and global warming and extreme weather continues to rise. So what does the Bible say about those specific issues? Well, what we know is that in God's kingdom, water really won't be a problem. If you're still in Isaiah, just come to Isaiah chapter 35. And what a picture this is of, of the kingdom. Isaiah 35, and halfway through verse 6, we read, For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And the Bible says that water will spring up and turn deserts into beautiful lush green pastures. Completely against what's currently happening. What about the next one? What about deforestation? Well, I'll come to start with back a few pages to Isaiah chapter 14. And although the context here is about Israel and the peace that they will enjoy once they're back in their land, these words are still very relevant, I think. Isaiah 14, verse 7. Look at this for a verse. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. And I think that's literally how it will be. The whole earth at rest, man's relentless pursuit of gain at the expense of the world's natural resources will be quelled. In the book of Revelation, these, these two ideas about trees and water are brought together, aren't they, in that reading that we took earlier on. Just, just hold Isaiah, but come to Revelation chapter 22. And here the Apostle Paul saw a vision. And we read it earlier on, didn't we? Here's the vision that he saw. Revelation 22. 
verse 1. He says that the angel showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You couldn't get a more natural picture, could you? The world restored to how it was in Genesis. So water won't be a problem. Trees will flourish. And you get a sense of natural goodness. And most importantly, healing. The world needs healing. What about the millions who go hungry today? Well, let's come back to Psalm 72, verse 12 to start with. Psalm 72, verse 12. It says, For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. That's what God's going to do through his Son. He will help the poor and the needy. And we know that there are millions and millions of those in the world today. But verse 16 goes on to explain how, doesn't it? There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. And the promise of this psalm is that food will grow in places it doesn't today, on the tops of mountains. Farmers don't grow things on mountaintops. It doesn't work. They grow them in the valleys below. But in the kingdom, food grows everywhere. No one will be hungry. It will be bountiful. And when it shakes, it will roll down the valleys so people can be fed. And that's everybody that benefits. So finally then, what about the environment itself? Personally, I think we will see huge changes from things like less pollution, better air quality, improved oxygen levels, Constant and controlled temperatures. The earth flourishing in the natural way it should and the balance restored with the goodness that Genesis talks about when the world was first formed. That climate in that garden was was so comfortable that Adam and Eve didn't need clothes. I'm not suggesting we'll be naked in the kingdom. I'm just saying it was perfect. It'll be very different to what we have today. But just come by way of concluding quotation to Revelation chapter 21. Let's get a final picture of what Jerusalem will be like and how the climate is unlike anything we've ever seen before. Revelation 21 and verse 23. It tells us that the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And emanating from Jerusalem, from the throne of Jesus Christ, as the king of the whole earth, will be light unimaginable. And in verse 24, did you see, it speaks about those who are saved. They are privileged to walk in that light. Do you know we can already begin to do that? All of us can already begin to walk in that light because the basis of that light is found in this book. So we have a choice, don't we? We we can watch with concern and, and worry and almost panic, if you want, at the declining state of the world and the massive challenges the human race faces in the next three decades. Or we can turn to the creator and the sustainer of all life. The Lord God of heaven and earth. And we can open his word and we can read about his plan and his purpose. And we can look forward to a new world where the environment is cleaner and better in every way. And in ways we can't even imagine. Where agriculture is in balance with how the earth was designed. Where we'll find a world truly at peace. If that sounds appealing then we urge you to look into these things a little bit more deeply, to become as excited about these changes as we are, to understand that they're coming, that they cannot be stopped, but they are something that we can experience. Of course there are conditions upon that, but you know what those are. What we know is that it will be absolutely worth it.
in the words of one of our hymns, which says, We thank thee then, O Father, for all things bright and good, the sea time and the harvest, our life, our health, our food. No gifts have we to offer, for all thy love imparts, but that which thou desirest, our humble, thankful hearts. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. So thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. <laughs> 